Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. This is the second part of our discussion of linearization, and we finished the first part by answering this question, what do we do if we have some kind of nonlinearity in our system? And the answer was linearization, and now we want to linearize the nonlinearity or nonlinearities that exist in that system. In this part, let's now look at that process of linearization, and we will do it by examining this first order nonlinear differential equation, x prime minus 2x squared equals u, and you could think of this as being some non traditional circuit, first order circuit, that now has this nonlinearity in it that's x squared. If that was potentially like an RC circuit, now maybe that voltage on the capacitor is not just proportional to x, it's now actually proportional to x squared. So now let's look at this particular system to first of all what we probably want to do is rewrite it in the form that we are used to seeing which is now the the time rate of change or the derivative of our state vector needs to be equal to some function f on the right and so if we now add 2x squared to both sides we end up with 2x squared of t plus u of t and now we want to know is this particular system, is this f of x, u, is that linear or nonlinear? And in this case, I think it's pretty clear that this is nonlinear. And what makes it nonlinear is this squaring operation on the state variable x. And what we want to do now is figure out how do we go ahead and convert this, maybe approximate this nonlinear dynamical equation with a linear equation so that we can use or apply our techniques and strategies that we're developing in this class. What we want to do then is look at the general scenario we have some x prime of t, which is f of x of t, u of t, and this right-hand side now is what is causing us the problems because it contains, causing us the problems in the sense of applying our analysis or design strategies. This right-hand side, this f, now contains nonlinear terms involving x of t, u of t, or both. Meaning it might be sine of x, or it might be x times u. In our example, it's actually x times itself. It's a product of terms, or a product of one of our variables, which is x. So in general, we have some right-hand side that's nonlinear in our arguments and the picture that you can sort of think about relative to what we're doing is now we have this function f of x. Let's say that's this blue curve and now what we want to do is we actually want to maybe operate this system at or around this given value of x, and maybe we'll call that x naught. And around that particular point, what we are wanting to do is try to make that nonlinear curve look more linear. And what we can see then is at that point, x naught, our function 
gives us a value of f of x naught, and we are now operating, or hope to be operating, around this red dashed curve. And you can see that we can't venture too far away from x naught in order to preserve this linear approximation of the red dashed curve of this blue curve. So we're trying to focus attention on what we can do relative to this operating position x naught or operating point and we want to move around x naught slightly so that this red dashed curve gives us a pretty good approximation of the blue curve around that region. And the way that we're going to make this or perform this approximation of the blue curve with the red dashed straight line is through Taylor series expansion. In a Taylor series expansion we have some function and we'll say it's a function of x and u. We now are going to evaluate that function around the nominal condition which here we're showing as x naught. I'm just showing it as a function of one variable so that we can draw a picture but it could be now a function of many variables where x could be a vector and u could be a vector but now we're just looking at it in terms of in this picture one variable x but now we are evaluating that nonlinear expression at x naught u naught but that's obviously not going to be f for all of x and u and so we now need to start taking the partial of f with respect to x and evaluate that at x equal x naught and u equal u naught and multiply it by this small variation around x naught plus the partial of f with respect to u. Again, we would evaluate that if we have in that expression for the partial of f with respect to u, if in that expression we have an x, we replace it with x naught. If we have u's, we replace those with u naught. And then that's scaled by this linear expansion, so now u minus u naught around that operating point x naught u naught. So x naught u naught is our operating condition and we just keep going. We have the second partial of f with respect to x, second partial of f with respect to u, partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to u. We have these higher order terms in the general Taylor series expansion. But in this case, we don't want to have x squareds or u squareds, and that's what we would have if we kept those higher order terms. So we're going to throw those away and deal with this approximation and hope that if we keep x minus x not small and u minus u not small, then x minus x naught squared, u minus u naught squared is even smaller, and getting rid of those higher order terms makes sense. What we now want to do is essentially remove this operating condition, f of x naught u naught, from both sides, so that we, if we subtract f of x naught u naught from both sides and throw away the higher order terms, then we end up with the following. We have f of x u minus f of x naught u naught. And since we're throwing away the higher order terms, this is now an approximation, which is equal to the partial of f with respect to x. But again, we need to evaluate that at the nominal operating condition times x minus x naught plus the partial of f with respect to u, u minus u naught. And again, this partial also needs to be evaluated at u equal to u naught and x equal to x naught. And this particular 
comparison of the nonlinear expression f of x u with the value of that expression at the nominal condition provides us with the dynamic behavior or the variation of this system around the nominal operating condition. And the nominal operating condition is, in fact, this f of x naught u naught. Let's see if we can put this into our earlier example. Remember, we had this particular case, x prime is equal to 2x squared plus u of t. Let's go back to that example and see if we can start taking some of these partials and seeing what we end up with. Can we now approximate that nonlinear behavior with a linear system of equations? We're now returning to the example that was being used to try to illustrate this concept of linearization and we now have x prime of t is equal to 2x squared of t plus u of t. Now, suppose that somebody says, well, if we're going to linearize this, we need to linearize about a given operating condition. Suppose now that somebody suggests or recommends that we try the following normal operating point in this case. And suppose they say, suppose we have x nominally at 1, and to keep us at 1, we let u naught equal minus 2. Now what we need to do is determine if x naught u naught actually satisfies this nonlinear differential equation. Does f of x naught u naught actually satisfy x naught prime? Let's verify that. So if we look at x evaluated at x naught and differentiate it with respect to time, is that now equal to f of x naught of t u naught of t? Well, if we differentiate x naught, which is 1, with respect to time, what happens? 1 is a constant. We differentiate that with respect to time, and we get 0. That's now equal to, now we evaluate this f at x naught and u naught. Everywhere we see an x, we replace it with x naught. Everywhere we see a u, we replace it with u naught. So now we have this 2 x squared of t plus u of t evaluated at x equal x naught equaling 1 and u equal u naught equaling minus 2. Substituting those values in, we have 2 times 1 squared plus minus 2, or we now have that's equal to 2, minus 2, which is 0, and we have a right-hand side of 0, which equals this time rate of change on the left-hand side, which was 0, and indeed, letting x not equal 1 and u not equaling minus 2, that does allow us to satisfy the governing differential equation. And that was, again, a nonlinear differential equation. Let's establish a little bit of notation to maybe make the analysis a little cleaner 
possibly, and here's the notation that we're going to establish. We're going to introduce a delta notation, so let's suppose that we let x minus x naught equal a delta x, and u minus u naught u minus u naught equal a delta u. Or we could now say if we wrote those in terms of x and u, if we solve the first equation for x, that's now just x naught plus delta x, and u is just u naught plus delta u. Or if you wanted to think about this in terms of a picture, let's say here is x, and now suppose that we are operating about this point x naught. And if we now move over here to x, this difference, x minus x naught, is our delta x. And we want to know what's the dynamic behavior of delta x. Does delta x behave? meaning does it shrink to zero as time evolves in this linear approximation, or does delta x go crazy or go unbounded? Is it stable or unstable? So now we need to write our linearized form of these equations using this notation. We have what we started with, which was x prime, but that in terms of x naught and delta of x, that's now x naught plus delta of x differentiated. But that differentiation easily goes through this addition operation. So now we have x naught prime plus delta x prime. And we've now applied the Taylor series expansion to that on the right hand side. So that says that f of x naught u naught, that's op the nonlinear expression evaluated at our operating condition, and we're approximating it, so we're throwing away all the higher order terms, and we're only keeping these first order terms. Partial of f evaluated at the operating condition times x minus x naught, which is delta x, plus partial of f with respect to u, multiplied by delta u. This curly approximation symbol is because of this Taylor series expansion. We're throwing away the higher order terms and if this operating condition does satisfy our nonlinear dynamics, then we know that its time rate of change actually equals f of x naught u naught. That's what we verified right here for our particular example. We said suppose our operating condition is x naught is 1 and u naught is minus 2. We actually showed that x naught prime was equal to f of x naught u naught. So we're selecting our operating condition such that x naught prime is equal to f of x naught u naught. If these two expressions are equivalent and one's on the left side and one's on the right side of the equality sign or this approximation sign, we can essentially remove those and that now gives us the following. It now says that we have the time rate of change of delta of x is approximately equal to this partial derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at x equal x naught u equal u naught times delta of x plus partial of f with respect to u x equal x naught u equal u naught times delta u. That is now, if you look at it, this is what we want. Here is, in fact, our linear approximation of the nonlinear system. We have a 
dynamical relationship on this small variation of delta x. And this is going to tell us around this operating point x naught right here what happens to the dynamics. What happens to delta of x? Well the time rate of change of delta of x is now equal to the partial of f with respect to x times delta of x and that's a linear operation since we're evaluating at x naught u naught we're getting rid of all of the unknowns in that partial of f with respect to x likewise with partial of f with respect to u. Let's now go back to our example and implement or going, going ahead and trying to now apply this expression of this linearized form to our example. We have f of x u is equal to 2 x squared plus u. And for that case we can now find the partial of f with respect to x. That's why we've submitted ourselves to all this calculus experience. Now we know that that's 4x, but we really need to now simply evaluate that. Everywhere we see an x in that expression, we replace it with x naught. Everywhere we see a u, we replace it with u naught. And in this example, we've selected a particular operating point of x not equal to 1 and u not equal to minus 2. In our case then if we evaluate that partial when x not is equal to 1 and u not is equal to minus 2 we end up with 4 times 1 or 4 we do something similar when we take the partial of f with respect to u. Now if we differentiate f, that 2x squared plus u, with respect to u, again our calculus tells us that's 1. Everywhere we see x in that equation we replace it with 1. Everywhere we see a u we replace it with minus 2. Well there's no x or u present so that now the partial of f with respect to u evaluated at those nominal values which aren't even in play for this system leaves us with partial of f with respect to u equal to 1. Now that we have these terms evaluated for right here and here. Now we can use those to establish our linear dynamics. We now can find our linearized dynamics for this particular nonlinear system around that operating point that we've selected and we see that we have delta of x prime is equal to 4 delta of x plus and what was the partial of f with respect to u evaluated where it was that was equal to 1. These numbers again that's just this partial of f with respect to x evaluated at x not equal to 1 and u not equal to minus 2. This 1 was the partial of f with respect to u. Again evaluated at the operating point. And this may look a little bit funny because of all these deltas, but remember we are now simply asking the question if we move slightly away from x naught in this particular let's say one dimensional case. If we move around x naught to a point x that's now a delta x away from x naught. How's that delta x going to dynamically perform? Will it move back towards x naught or will it move away from x naught? 
And if that doesn't seem to be clean in terms of what you're used to thinking, then simply get rid of these deltas and call them something else. You could say, oh, well, that's really just a first order system, and I'm going to replace delta x with z. So now I have z time rate of change, or z dot, or z prime, is equal to 4z plus v of t. And now I have a time domain system that I'm more maybe familiar with. My variable of interest is z. This is all the dynamic behavior around an operating point in this state space. And now you might ask, is this system stable or not? Is that z prime equation stable around that nominal operating point? Is when we move ever so slightly for whatever reason, if we get bumped away from x naught, will we now come back to x naught naturally? Will our system be stable? Or if we get bumped away from that, think of that x naught like a pencil that you're holding in your palm of your hand and you're trying to balance that pencil. If you're really good, maybe you can keep that pencil balanced without moving much. But now if a little gust or you get bumped, now if that pencil develops a, an angle other than straight up and down, it may now easily fall over. So now that pencil, pencil's dynamics, may be unstable. In order to check stability, we would need to convert this into either a frequency domain system and look for the poles in the transfer function of that system, or since we're in the time domain, we could actually look at the eigenvalues, and those are the same as what the poles give us in terms of dynamic behavior. Let's say that we now have this system modeled as a transfer function, and we want to know if we now plotted the poles of that dynamic system, it's now a linear time invariant system which allows us to take it into the frequency domain. Where do those poles need to live in order for the system to be stable? And if you haven't had a course in stability, hopefully you will learn in this class where those poles need to be. And in fact, those poles actually need to be all in the left half plane, where the left half plane is all to the left of this imaginary axis that's vertical. And for our particular system, or for any system that's modeled by a transfer function, for stability, we need all, not three out of two, I'm sorry, not two out of three, not 59 out of 60, but we need all 60, we need all three. For stability, we need all poles in the left half plane, and a lot of times I will simply abbreviate that as LHP. So stability, a new concept maybe, but you should have probably had this in some circuits class, that requires all poles in the left half plane. And if you wanted to, you could now take this time domain expression, Laplace transform it, and find the transfer function. You should be able to do that. To get the transfer function, you can neglect the initial conditions. You now have some transfer function, let's say that we now look for that in the frequency domain. We now have s, z of s, is equal to 4 
z of s plus v of s. And since we're looking for a transfer function, we can neglect the initial conditions. Or we now have s minus 4 z of s is equal to v of s, and the transfer function of this system in the frequency domain, which is an input of v of s and an output of z of s, is now 1 over s minus 4. The poles are the values of s that cause the denominator to vanish. We have a first order polynomial in s. We set that denominator polynomial equal to 0. We see that s is equal to plus 4. s equal to plus 4 puts us over here in the right half plane. And so this particular system, this nonlinear system, when we linearize it, is actually going to be unstable, which means that if you get bumped a little bit away from x0, you're going to move even further away from x0 unless you implement some control strategy. And that's one of the points of this class, is to try to better a, or obtain ways to stabilize unstable systems. And we'll pick up with a higher order version of linearization in our next time together.